collecting the last year and the final Nibbana of the Buddha can, can be inspiring for several reasons. Um, we hear the last teachings and encouragements that the Buddha gives us to inspire Dhamma practice. And we can also see how the Buddha is caring for the Sangha and the teaching that he established. We can see how he prepares his disciples for his departure to make sure that the Buddhist community and the way of practice that he established can continue after he passed away. It can also be inspiring because you can see how the heart of the Buddha is unaffected by um, sickness and death. And and of course, it can also be inspiring to recollect the complete peace of final Libana, the complete cessation of birth and death, the stilling of all formations, of all conditioned phenomena. So I only give an overview of the most important events. If you want to read the whole story, um, it can be found then in the Diganikaya Long Discourses of the Buddha, um, Sutta number 16. This is the longest sutta in the whole Sutta Pitaka. <coughs> the last year of the Buddha, um, was the last year of his life, the Buddha was already 80 years old. Um, and so after teaching for 45 years, his mission was accomplished. Not by his teaching efforts, he had several thousand disciples who had the, realized the complete liberation that the Buddha had realized himself. And then also at least maybe several 10,000 people who realized the first stage of awakening stream entry and were at least irreversible, sure to realize complete liberation. He had many disciples who had realized his teaching um, to the highest level and then they were able to explain it and um, lead others to the same liberation as well. He established a monastic community with a detailed structure and um, yeah, so basically the Buddhist community and the teaching that they established, they could continue without him now because um, there were these people who realized it and this method this way of practice that the Buddha discovered himself could be passed on by the disciples themselves. And the account of the last year of the Buddha starts a few months before his last Vasa, his last rain season retreat. At that time he is staying near Rajagaha, in the capital of the kingdom of Magadha. He's living at Mount Vulture's Peak one of the hills close to the city. At the time, Ajatasattu is the king of Magadha and he wants to attack and conquer the Vachi confederation. Um, it's the country north of his kingdom. Um, king Ajatasattu became a disciple of the Buddha, but he's still ambitious and um, yeah, wants to expand his kingdom, so the Dhamma hasn't maybe sunk in so deeply <laughs> um, and yeah, so the king sends his chief minister to the Buddha to convey his respects and to tell him about his plan to attack the Vajans. Probably the king is hoping to get some hints from the Buddha whether he, like his plan to attack them can be successful or not. And so the, the chief minister, Vasakara, goes to the Buddha and pays homage to him and tells him about King Ajatasattu's plan. Um, but the Buddha says um, at so one point he was staying in Visali in the capital of the Vajans and he told them seven qualities that will lead to their progress and non-decline. And these qualities um, can still be found. They, they practice these seven things. 
and then the, the minister says oh if they even keep one of these qualities then it will be not possible to to conquer them so they they, they will only be able to sort of succeed with some subversive methods to sort of um, weaken them but not directly to attack them and then the buddha uses the opportunity to teach the monks um, qualities that will to their prosperity and non-decline um, to prepare them for the time when the buddha is um, entering final nibbana and so some of these um, <coughs> qualities are like more internal or some external just a few examples so the uh, he, he tells Venerable Ananda to assemble all the monks who live in, uh, in Rajagaha and then he's teaching him these um, different sets of non-decline um, qualities. So for example, as long as the monks hold regular and frequent assemblies, they may expect to prosper and not to decline. And as long as they meet in harmony, um, depart in harmony and carry out the business in harmony, they may be expected to prosper and not to decline. And as long as they do not authorize what has not been authorized already and do not abolish what has not been abolished and they proceed according to the training rules that they um, have been set by the Buddha. So this would be more like community qualities. Um, or as long as they honor, respect and revere the senior monks um, who are long ordained and then as long as they do not fall prey to desires which arise in them and lead to further becoming as long as they develop uh, as long as they are devoted to live in forest lodgings and as long as they keep in mind how can they make good monks come to the monastery or to the place and how can they make the monks who live already here feel at ease and um, live comfortably and so as long as the monks um, practice these seven things then they can be expected to prosper not to decline then some of the sets are also more internal for example as long as they develop the seven factors of enlightenment or as long as they develop the perception of impermanence or non-self so it would be more like meditation qualities if they if they practice that um, or some other like more like basic things like that the the monks do not rejoice the lights in work in chattering in sleeping in company in being ambitious and associating with evil friends and as long as they do not rest content with partial partial spiritual achievements so yeah the buddha gives different sets teaching the monks trying to prepare them that they can yeah, continue to to practice and that the monastic order in the Dhamma will last for a long time. Yeah, so after the Buddha stayed as long as he liked in Rajagaha, then he's leaving the city with his personal attendant, Venerable Ananda. And even at age 80, the Buddha is still wandering, um, walking long distances to teach people in various places in northern India. So first he's wandering to Ambalataka and then onwards to Nalanda, the hometown of one of his chief disciples, Venerable Sariputta. He meets Venerable Sariputta there. This is probably the last meeting between the Buddha and his greatest disciple because then both Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mamogalana um, 
they're found in the Bahama Ocaras a few months before the Buddha. And so the Venomous Tariputta sort of makes an inspired utterance that he, he says, he has the clarity that there has never been and there will never be some monk or Brahmin who is more awakened than the Buddha. And then the Buddha questions him, have you read the mind of all the Buddhas of the past so that you really know that, that there's never been any Buddha who has realized some higher state? Or have you read the mind of all the Buddhas in the future that they will not realize some higher state than he, he has? And he says no, but he knows the the law of the Dhamma. So he says it's just like if there would be a city and um, it would be surrounded by a high wall without any gap and there's only one entrance and then this a gatekeeper would know like all this what, whatever people come in they all come through this one gate and so he says similar in the same way all Buddhas of the past and future they will realize awakening by abandoning the five hindrances and developing the four foundations of mindfulness and the seven enlightenment factors just like the Buddha so they will not they will realize the same awakening that the Buddha has realized um, after that the Buddha wanders in stages northwards to Vesali the capital of the Vajans that's the kingdom that King Ajatasattu wants to attack or at least planning to um, and shortly before the start of the rain season he sends the monks who are traveling with him to stay for the rain season near Vesali and, but he tells them that he himself will stay for the rain season in a small village called Bedova with Venerable Ananda During the rain season, the Buddha already gets seriously ill. Um, Yeah, so the, the Buddha gets attacked by severe sickness with sharp pains, um, bordering to death. Um, but he endures them mindfully and clearly comprehending um, without getting disturbed. And he thinks it wouldn't be right if he would, um, it, it wouldn't be right if his final Libana would occur without giving some last instructions. And so he is sort of intent on staying alive and then the Buddha recovers from this sickness and then at one point he sits outside of his dwelling and the yeah, Venerable Ananda is sort of very distressed that the Buddha is so sick or was so sick and um, yeah, so he's happy that he recovered um, and so, so the because he, he has this confidence that the Buddha wouldn't pass away without giving some final instructions. Um, but yeah, the Buddha <coughs> is already preparing him for his final Libana and says, but what does the order of monks expect from me? He has already taught everything for 45 years in all detail. And um, so what other sort of orders or recommendations should he give to the monks? 
and then yeah so he says um, it is now old and burned with years already and um, has come to the last stage of life and therefore they should dwell with themselves therefore Ananda dwell with herself as island with herself as refuge there's no other uh, island with, uh, with, uh, with no other refuge and um, dwell with the Dhamma as island and with the Dhamma as refuge um, and without other, any other island and without any other refuge um, so the the Buddha says then how does the monk dwell with himself as island and with himself as refuge um, yeah, by, by developing the four foundations of mindfulness and so the, the Buddha encourages basically the, the, the developing the four satipatthanas so that our heart becomes an island that no flood can overwhelm mm, yeah, because the four foundations of mindfulness are the path for purification of beings and to realize Nibbana and so they, they aim at the cessation of clinging and so yeah and there's this in the Satipatthanas there's this um, sort of refrain after each section he dwells independent and doesn't cling to anything in the world and so that yeah, is related to this to this statement of the Buddha that if you practice the four foundations of mindfulness um, then and we have this stability or this develop this inner stability or peace and then if we practice the four satipatthanas then we look at our experience more and more in line with the Dhamma yeah, and so what the Buddha means by that is it, it means being a dwelling with ourselves as island and refuge is that we gain a true refuge by practicing the four satipatthanas the four foundations of mindfulness and because of the stability and sort of clarity liberation of the heart that is the result of this practice After the Buddha has completed his last rains retreat, his last vasa, he's going back to Visali. And then one day, um, he and Venerable Ananda, after they finish the arms round, they go together on the arms round, and then he tells him to go with him um, to one of the shrines near Visali. It's called the Chapala Shrine, a beautiful place in nature to spend the afternoon together there and while they stay there the Buddha is hinting to Venerable Ananda that he completely developed the four bases of power the four Idipadas and that he would be able to extend his life further um, however Venerable Ananda does not pick up the hint and so on that day the Buddha gives up his intention to extend his life further and um, which means that he will enter final Nibbana in three months time this is then irreversible and so probably the Buddha would have passed away during that Vasa um, when he was seriously ill but yeah, he used his psychic powers to prolong his life to give some last teachings and instructions and but from now on he sort of just lets the body decay according to his own nature and doesn't sort of prolong it the lifespan anymore And so then, after that, the Buddha tells Venerable Ananda to go with him to a large assembly hall close to Visali, and he sends him as messenger to assemble all the monks who live around the city. 
and yeah, announces that he will enter Fandi Bana in three months. Yeah, so he then tells the monks those qualities that I've taught, that I've directly known, you should remember them, practice and develop and cultivate them, so that this holy life may endure long and last long for the benefit, welfare and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, welfare and happiness of devas and humans. And what are those qualities that I've taught? The four foundations of mindfulness, the right efforts, the four bases of spiritual power, the four faculties, the five strengths, the seven factors of awakening, the Noble Eightfold Path. These are the qualities that I've taught, that I've directly known. And now, monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are subject to decay. Attain the goal by diligence. The final Libana of the Tathagata will occur soon. In three months' time will be the final Libana of the Tathagata. Then he speaks these verses. I've become old. Limit is, limited is my lifespan. Leaving you, I will go, having made my refuge for myself. Be diligent, monks, mindful and virtuous. With your heart set on your purpose, take care of your mind. He who in this dumb and vineyard lives diligent, leaving the wandering on in samsara, will make an end to suffering. And after he goes on last arms round in Vesali, um, the Buddha then uses his last three months um, to set out to a last teaching tour to five different towns. So, what will the Buddha teach during the last year of his life? Maybe will he reveal some special secret teaching, secret teaching that he never taught before? <laughs> um, so, no, because the Buddha was always teaching with an open hand, so he didn't hold back any information. Um, there was no special version of the Dhamma that he taught to some inner circle of disciples. Was, um, there were some special, no special privileged people, something like that. Um, and yeah, the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda, I've taught the Dhamma without making an inside and outside version that the targeter is no closed fist with regard to the teachings. So in the sense that he didn't hold back any information and he doesn't make any sort of insider version of the Dhamma and sort of outsider version of the Dhamma. <laughs> um, and in another discourse, the Buddha also says, three things shine openly, not in secret. The sun, the moon, and the Dhamma in Vinaya that was taught by the Tathagata. So, um, yeah, it's a nice simile, so he doesn't, from the beginning he taught according to his ability whoever was interested in the Dhamma, and um, yeah, so there was no, I think it was maybe a tradition was in India that maybe some spiritual teachers would hold back some special teaching for some privileged disciples, something like that. Um, Yeah, so that's interesting to consider because that some scriptures which were written later than several years after the Buddha they claim that there would be some special higher teaching of the Buddha which were kept secret until people were sort of ready to understand them. And while, while the Buddha, you can see from his discourses what he says, he actually never gave any secret higher teachings. In this sense, he, he just taught people to whatever level they were able to understand it, the Dhamma. And um, similar in some later traditions, then it became very important that you get some special in it initiation from some teacher before I can receive some special higher teachings. And it's also not in line with how the Buddha was teaching. Um, so that's also something interesting to at least consider.
So instead of revealing some special secret teaching that was never taught before, <laughs> the Buddha is repeating again and again the most important things, the essence of his teaching that he taught already for 45 years to make sure that people remember it. And um, one can also then see later, for example, the last teaching that he gives is about the Noble Eightfold Path, which is the same as his first teaching in, <laughs> in, in Varanasi in the Deer Park. Um, and so in the in the Ma Parinibbana Sutta, most often he's teaching the threefold training of the Noble Eightfold Path. The, this is virtue, this is samadhi, this is wisdom. And based on virtue, um, samadhi is of great fruit and great benefit. And developed based on samadhi, wisdom is of great fruit and great benefit. And developed with wisdom, the the heart is liberated from all taints, from the taint of sensuality, the taint of becoming, and the taint of ignorance. And so this is the most common sort of summary that it gives. Obviously it's just a summary, but um, the sense that he would teach about these topics and yeah, about the Four Noble Truths and these different sets of um, qualities that he taught, that he just mentioned that is when he announces his um, find the banner will be in three months. So like the four foundations of mindfulness and the four right efforts and so on um, that he already taught for 45 years. The Buddha also says that we shouldn't think that he the Buddha also says that we shouldn't think that we now have no teacher anymore after he passed away. Um, what he taught us, Dhamma and Vinaya, his teaching and his monastic discipline, that should be a teacher or master after he's passed away. So the Buddha didn't appoint a person, a successor, but his teaching and his monastic discipline. And in the Mahaparinipana Sutta, he also gives the four great standards. So he says, if a senior monk or a group of senior monks is saying this is the Buddha's teaching, this is the monastic discipline, then we should carefully check in his discourses and in the Vinaya if it can be really found there. And if it cannot be found there, we should come to the conclusion that this is actually not the teaching of the Buddha, but it was wrongly understood by these senior monks. So he gives the Dhamma a higher authority than any, gr any group of senior monks um, or any individual monk. Probably also because he knows that um, the Dhamma has been so well established and will be transmitted that it's more reliable to make this uh, of the, the highest authority. Yeah, so by teaching that we shouldn't think that we don't have a teacher anymore, and the Buddha tries to encourage us that we can just practice his teaching even if he's not alive anymore. And then the Buddha discovered this way of practice that leads to liberation and we can apply it also if he's not alive anymore. That's just like similar like with any ordinary invention. So like for example Thomas Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, but then and he, he died a long time ago, but we can still use and build light bulbs. The law of nature that makes them work is just the same whether he's alive or not. And so it's the same with, with the teaching of the Buddha and Sometimes the Buddha says that, that even if you remember the Dhamma, it actually will have the same effect, just like if the Buddha himself would come to teach you. So for example, in one case, when a, a monk passes away and then he makes a statement, there some, the Buddha or a disciple might come to teach you when you pass away. But then he also says, if you remember the Dhamma, this actually can have the same effect just like if the Buddha himself would come to teach you.
Yeah, also good to remember. You can still get close to the Buddha, just like the great disciples who lived together with him. And the further we practice this method that he taught, the closer we will get to the Buddha, until we ultimately we reach the same liberation that he realized himself. So in this way, the further we develop Dhamma practice, the closer we will get to the Buddha. Yeah, so that's more or less a summary of the teachings that the Buddha gives over the last year of his life. And um, yeah, teaching in these five different towns. And then he's heading for a town called the Pava. The Buddha is arriving with a large group of monks in the town and staying at a manga grove of a person called Chunda, the son of the smith. Chunda hears that the Buddha is staying at the manga grove and goes to pay respects to him. The Buddha gives him a Dhamma talk and after that Chunda invites him for the meal for the next day. And that will be already the last day of the life of the Buddha. In the morning, Chunda comes to the Buddha and informs him that the meal is ready. And then, after that, the, the Buddha, the monks have eaten. Then the Buddha gives him some more Dhamma instructions and departs with the monks. Mm, however, soon afterwards, the Buddha gets seriously ill, is intense pain bordering to death, and also diarrhea and blood and um, probably a case of food poisoning. Yeah, so the Buddha endures the painful feelings, mindfully and clearly comprehending without being disturbed by them. In case you're wondering whether Chunda made some bad karma for serving the last meal to the Buddha, um, the Buddha addresses this question then soon afterwards. Yeah, he says that it was actually a great benefit for Chunda that he offered the last meal to him. Um, he says that offering the Buddha the meal before his awakening and before his final Ibana are equally great merit. Obviously Chunda didn't have a bad intention, he wa didn't want to poison the Buddha or he genuinely wanted to have offer some good food and um, also the lifespan of the Buddha was already at the end so he wouldn't have lived longer. So after the Buddha has recovered from the effects of the meal then he says to Venerable Ananda, come Ananda let us go to Kusinara. <coughs> The body of the Buddha is already getting weaker, one notices in the, the sutta. He has to rest and sit down sometimes on the way. And sometimes he asks Venerable Ananda to bring him some water to drink. However, even though the Buddha is already 80 years old and, and weakened from his illness, then um, yeah, he starts to look bright and radiant like never before. As he continues on his way to Kusinara, he meets um, uh, a man called Pukusa Malaputta and after a short conversation with the Buddha, um, he takes refuge and offers him some um, special set of golden robes. And as the Buddha is putting them on, Venerable Ananda is amazed and notices how bright and radiant the Buddha looks, even in comparison to the robes. And the Buddha says, So is it, Ananda. On two occasions, the Tathagata, the Buddha, will be especially bright and radiant. On the night when he attains the unsurpassable supreme awakening, and on the night of his final Ibana. 
So, und dann. Ja, es ist gut zu remember der Buddha on our hands. When they pass away, they are not just someone who sort of dies peacefully, but at final Libana, death dies. Well, the final Libana is the complete cessation of birth and death. Birth and death are dependently a recent phenomena maintained by causes by ignorance and clinging and when they are abandoned then birth and death will die they will cease completely and then also everything that arises and passes away will come to cessation then And the final Libana is also the cessation of time. As long as there is some arising and passing away, then there is some experience of time. But when everything that arises and passes away has ceased, then it will also be the end of time. And the Buddha says that the five khandhas, the form, feeling, perception, and formations and consciousness, they are the manifestation of death and decay. And they have three characteristics. They, they arise and they pass away, and they become otherwise. And Yeah, and so then when the manifestation of death and decay ends, then there will only be the complete peace that doesn't arise, doesn't pass away, and doesn't become otherwise, the stilling of all formations, of all conditioned phenomena, Nibbana. And so this is why the Buddha is looking so bright and radiant now, because soon birth and death will die. And yeah, there will only be the ultimate peace of final Libana. The Buddha reaches then Kakuda River on his way to Kusinara. He goes down to the river and to drink and take a last bath. Then he's lying down briefly in a mango grove um, nearby. And he's briefly resting before he crosses over to, to the other shore to the Hiranyavati River with a large group of monks. And then he reaches um, the Sarji forest near Kusinara. <coughs> yeah. Venerable Ananda, who was his attendant for 25 years, is preparing the final resting place for the Buddha between the twin Sarji trees. And as the Buddha is lying there between the two Sarji trees, they start to spontaneously flower out of season and shower the body of the Buddha with flowers. And also heavenly coral trees, coral tree flowers are covering the Buddha um, in homage. And so then the Buddha says, but this is not the way that the, that the Tathagata is worshipped, honored and respected and venerated and paid homage to. But a monk, nun or a lay person who lives practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, who practices in the proper way. He or she worships, honors, respects, 
that are targeted in the highest way. Um, therefore, you should train yourself thus. You will live practicing in accordance with the Dhamma. You will practice in the, in the proper way. So, emphasizing the part is called the Patipati Puja rather than the Amisa Puja. So, the highest way of worshipping the Buddha is by practicing the Dhamma rather than, for example, offering some flowers or incense or so on. So this is also one way of worshipping, which is also beneficial. But the most beneficial one is to to apply his teaching um, and to realize it. <coughs> At that time also a monk, Venerable Upavana, is standing in front of the Buddha and fanning him, because at the time of the year, um, the, the afternoon is often hot in India. But the Buddha sends him away and tells him he shouldn't stand in front of him. So Venerable Ananda is wondering why does the Buddha send him, send this monk away now? And the Buddha explains. Um, now more devas from ten world system have come um, to see the Buddha for the last time. And um, in more than 80 kilometers around the Saltree forests, there's not a space even as big as the tip of a hair, which is not occupied by powerful devas but powerful divine beings. And so some of them are unhappy because this monk was standing in front of him and so they didn't see the Buddha. Um, they didn't get a chance to see the Buddha. Venerable Ananda then says to the Buddha, in the past, after the end of the rain season, monks would come from all directions and go to meet the Buddha. But now they don't have this opportunity to visit him anymore. And the Buddha says that instead of visiting him, people can visit the main Buddhist pilgrimage sites. Nubini, where he was born, Bodhgaya, where he attained awakening, Sanat, where he started to teach, where he set in motion the unsurpassable Dhamma wheel, and Kusinara, where his final Nibbana occurred. Yeah, and so on this occasion, the Buddha designates this place as a pilgrimage site. Yeah, Venerable Ananda asks the Buddha then what would be appropriate for his funeral arrangements after he passed away. The Buddha first tells him he shouldn't be concerned about his funeral arrangements. He should just um, practice diligently to realize the goal of Dhamma practice. And wise lay people would care confident would care to do the funeral arrangements. But then, whenever Ananda asks the Buddha again, and he says that a perfectly awakened one should be cremated like a wheel-turning emperor. And gives him some the instructions about the sort of proper cremation procedure and how the body should be cremated and then how a stupa should be erected. And he also explains that a Buddha or a noble disciple of a Buddha are worthy of a stupa. And he says that the benefit of a stupa is that people sort of will recollect him or his disciples. And by that, yeah, the mind will get uplifted and brightened. And so a stupa is an external mon mon monument that helps recollect the Buddha, the disciple of the Buddha, and gives people the opportunity to pay respects to them after they've passed away. Yeah, so when Venerable Ananda hears the Buddha, talking about his own funeral arrangements. That's too much for him. He starts to cry and, <laughs> and um, um, he goes to his own dwelling and starts crying and, and says, I'm still a disciple in training. The teacher is passing away who was so compassionate to me. Um, so he, because he's not around yet and he has this sort of personal attachment to the Buddha as well. <laughs> uh, 
um, he said. Um, so the Buddha notices, of course, and um, he sends a monk to call Venerable Ananda back and is consoling him. Enough, Ananda. Don't weep and lament. Have I not already told you that all things that are pleasing and delightful are changeable, subject to separation and becoming otherwise? How could it be, Ananda, since whatever is born has become and is dependently arisen is subject to decay? How could it be that it should not pass away? For a long time, Ananda, you have been in the Tathagata's presence, showing loving kindness in acts of body, speech and mind, beneficially, blessedly and wholeheartedly. You have done much merit, Ananda. Make an effort, and in a short time you will be free from defilements. So he's uh, encouraging him to uh, continue, and um, he's also then saying that all the Buddhas of the past had such an excellent, foremost personal attendant like Venerable Ananda, and that also all Buddhas in the future will have similar, excellent personal attendant. So after Venerable Ananda has recovered from his grief for the moment, the Buddha sends him um, as messenger to Kusinara to inform the people that the final barn of the Buddha will occur in the last watch of the night. And, um, this. Yeah, so he tells him to inform them, today in the last watch of the night, the final barn of the Tathagata will occur. Go to visit him, don't forget it later. The final ban of the target occurred near our village, but we didn't get to see him a last time. So, encouraging them to come. And um, so, Venerable Ananda goes to Kusinara with a second monk as companion to inform the people. So, this happens probably in the evening before sunset. And so as the first watch of the night starts, um, the people of Kusinara all walking out to the sultry forest um, to pay the last respects to the Buddha and see my last time. And yeah, it's a clear and bright full moon, full moon night. The moon is just rising and illuminating the star grove. But there are so many people who have come to see the Buddha that it would take longer than the whole night that they've paid respects. And so when Ananda is, as attendant, is sort of managing these things and he's thinking how can he give them an opportunity to all pay respects. And so he's arranging them in groups of a whole extended family, maybe 10 people or so. And um, so in this way, the people of Kusinara all get an opportunity to see the Buddha a last time already during the first watch of the night. Yeah, and that time, also a wandering ascetic is staying at Kusinara. His name is Subhadra, and he has heard that the Buddha will pass away at the end of the night. And he, he has heard from his teachers that only very rarely a perfectly awakened one arises in the world. But he has some doubts and he has the confidence that the Buddha can clarify this doubt. So he goes to see the Buddha. So he's the this ascetic wanderer, Subhadra, is, wants to see the Buddha. He's going to the Sarti Grove and then he asked Venerable Ananda, Venerable Ananda, may I have permission to see the Samana Gotama? But Venerable Ananda tries to protect the Buddha from, um, how to say, getting disturbed because it's already the last few hours of his life. And so he, he tells him, enough, Venerable Subhadra, 
don't disturb the targeter. That the targeter is tired. Then that's super the is insistent and asks the second time and the third time. But still, then then Anna is refusing. Um, but yeah, the, the Buddha is overhearing their conversation and then he says Enough Ananda, don't hinder Subhadda, let him see the Tathagata. Whatever he asks me is for the sake of knowledge, and not because he wants to annoy me. And whatever I will explain to him, he will understand it quickly. And so when Ananda says, go in, friend Subhadda, the, the Blessed One gives you permission. And, um, yeah, so then the this wandering ascetic asks the Buddha, have all there are all these religious teachers who have different followings, um, have they all realized the truth? Or none of them or some of them? And the Buddha says, Enough Subhadda, never mind whether all of them have realized the truth or none or some. I will teach you the Dhamma. In whatever teaching and monastic discipline the Noble Eightfold Path is found, there are stream enterer, a uh, once returner, a non returner, and an arahant can be found. Um, and in whichever, yeah, so if, if there's a Noble Eightfold Path in the teaching, then these four levels of realization of the Dhamma can be found. And if the Noble Eightfold Path cannot be found in the teaching, then these four levels of realization cannot be found there. But in this Dhamma and Vinaya, the Noble Eightfold Path can be found. And also the realization of stream entry, once return, non return, and arahant. Um, and he says then if the monks live rightly, the world will not become empty of arahants. So yeah, this is also a great encouragement and promise of the Buddha. As long as people apply his teaching correctly, then there will also be people who have realized it, even if you are the last disciple of the Buddha. So there's a great statement, if the monks dwell rightly, if they practice correctly, the world will not become empty of arahants. Obviously that applies to lay people as well, but if, if they practice correctly, then they can realize the Dhamma on this four stages of awakening. So when Subhadda takes refuge and asks the Buddha to become a monk, and the Buddha tells Venerable Ananda to ordain him. And so in this way, Venerable Ananda gets the special honor to ordain the last personal disciple of the Buddha. <coughs> Second watch of the night from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. is already advancing. And so now the Buddha gives his last instructions to the monks who are present. And he says, It might be that you think the instruction of a teacher is ended. Now we have no more teacher. But it shouldn't be seen like this. What I've taught us, Dhamma and Vinaya, will be your teacher after I've passed away. And while the Buddha was alive, the monks addressed each other with friend, so like as, as equals. And he says this should not be practiced anymore. A junior should address a senior with bante or ayasma, something like a address of respect. Um, so it's let's say, strengthening the principle of respect for senior monks in the monastic order. <coughs> And then the Buddha is addressing the monks. It might be that some monks have some doubts or uncertainty about the Buddha, the Dhamma or the Sangha, or about the path or the practice. Ask monks, don't regret it afterwards. 
the teacher was before us, was in front of us, and we failed to ask him directly. And the monks stay silent. And so the Buddha repeats his invitation three times. And then he says to the monks, it might be that you don't ask out of respect for a teacher, then tell me from friend to friend, so then tell me as my friend. And so that's also something that the Buddha says already in another discourse um, once, where he says that the whole, whole life is noble friendship. And then the Buddha says, um, in this way, it may also be understood how the entire holy life is noble friendship. When beings come to me, to the Buddha, as noble friend, being subject to birth are freed from birth. Beings from being subjects from aging as freed from aging. Beings subject to death are freed from death. And beings sorrow from beings subject to sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are freed from sorrow, lamentation, pain, and grief, grief and despair. And so in this way it can be understood that the entire holy life is noble friendship. So yeah, here the Buddha um, says, yeah, that noble friendship is the most helpful external condition for Dhamma practice. So the Buddha gives his disciples the last opportunity to approach him and ask him as his noble friend. And then Venerable Ananda says, it's wonderf wonderful, it's amazing that there's no monk here in this assembly of 500 monks who has any doubts about the Buddha Dhamma or Sangha or the path of the practice. Um, but the Buddha says, you said that out of faith, Ananda, but that the Tagata has the knowledge. In this assembly of monks, there's um, even the last monk um, is a stream enterer and um, is um, on the path of awakening. And so all the monks who have the special honor to witness the final ban of the Buddha are noble disciples. Now the Buddha has given his disciples a last opportunity to help them as the noble friend. And now the only thing left for him to do is to point out to the most important internal quality for Dhamma practice, diligence, apamada. And so he speaks his final words. And now, monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are subject to decay. Attain the goal by diligence. Handadani bhikkave amantayami vo vayadhamma sankhara apamadena sampadita Yeah, after he has spoken his last words to stir up his disciples to attain the goal by diligence, the Buddha becomes silent and he withdraws from any external engagement. He then spends his final hours of his life in Samadhi, in meditative attainments. The reason why we know what happens to the Buddha after he becomes silent is that one of his greatest disciples is present. And Venerable Anuruddha, he is an Arahant who has all Samadhi attainments and all psychic powers. And he can look into the mind of the Buddha directly and see what happens. While, for example, Venerable Ananda doesn't have that ability he even thinks at one point that the Buddha has passed away already, but then Venerable Anuruddha is correcting him and says, no, no, he's just um, not yet passed away, but in these different Samadhi attainments. 
<coughs> yeah, so the Buddha is gradually going through the four jhanas and the four formless attainments um, and the cessation of perception and feeling in forward and reverse order, experiencing a last time different levels of inner peace before he leaves them behind forever as well. And that's also the most peaceful way of passing away. And if you think about it, in the, in the, f in the first jhana already all bodily painful feelings have disappeared. And then in the fourth jhana all bodily formations all activity of the body is completely stilled and also the breathing has stopped and the whole body is completely pervaded by the pure and bright mind and so around 3 a.m. when the night is most silent the Buddha who is radiant and bright like in the night of his awakening enters the ultimate peace of final Nibbana and illuminated by the bright full moon in the sky in the Sadhu grove in Kusinara. The moment when the Buddha passes away, the earth is shaking and Venerable Anuruddha speaks a verse on the occasion. There was no more in and out breath, and the one with stable heart, such, imperturbable, inclining to peace, the seeing one attained Nibbana. With undisturbed heart, he endured the painful feelings. Like a flame that has gone out was the liberation of the mind. And also Saka, the king of the Tavatingsa Devas, speaks a verse about the peace of the stilling of all formations. And also Brahma Sampati and Venerable Ananda. And in the last few hours of the night, Venerable Anaruda is consoling his brother. Venerable Ananda, after the Buddha has passed away, Venerable Anuruddha is already one of the great Arahants and Venerable Ananda um, is still further to practice. Um, and when it gets daylight again, Venerable Anuruddha is sending Venerable Ananda's messenger to the people of Kosinara to inform them that the Buddha has passed away. So the people of Kusinara gather flowers and scents and come out to honor and worship the body of the Buddha. They even set up tents and awnings because they want to spend the whole day there. And at the end, the Malas of Kusinara, the local clan, they called Malas, they spent the whole week worshiping the body of the Buddha. <coughs> and then on the seventh day, they decide to carry the Buddha out of the city through the southern gates to then to cremate the body of the Buddha south of Kusinara. So eight chiefs of the Malas try to lift up the body of the Buddha together, but they some are unable to lift him up. So they ask Venerable Anuruddha, who is the most eminent great disciple present, and he says your intention is different from the intention of the devas. <laughs> and then so they ask, what is the intention of the devas? And so he says, yeah, your intention is you plan to carry the Buddha, you plan to carry the body of the Buddha out through the southern gate and cremate him in the south of the city, south of Kusinara. But the intention of the devas 
is that the body that the body of the Buddha gets carried into the city into the city through the northern gate through the middle of the town and then to carry it out of the city through the eastern gate to the Muk to the Makuta is it Makuta Bandana shrine and then to cremate the body there. And so the Mala says the, the people then say if, if this is the intention of the Devas then may it be so <laughs> So they happily agree. Um, it seems the people of Kusinara sometimes didn't know what would be the appropriate um, arrangements for the funeral, and so the devas helped to get it arranged in the correct way. <coughs> so the malas carry the body of the Buddha, just like the devas intended, to the center of the town, to the Makita Banal Shrine, and put it down there and um, the Sutta says at that time even the rubbish heaps and sewers of Kusinara were covered knee deep in coral tree flowers so everything covered by flowers everywhere so many flowers then um. so the people of Kusinara ask Venerable Ananda how they should cremate the Buddha's body and he you know, relates the instructions that the Buddha gives to them uh, gave to him and so they, they wrap his body in many layers of cloth and erect a funeral pyre uh, with fragrant fragrant wood and then four chiefs of the Mala want to light the funeral pyre but it doesn't catch fire the, unable to light it Again, the people ask Venerable Anuruddha, and he tells them, the devas know Venerable Mahakasapa is right now traveling from Pava to Kusinara with a large group of monks, with 500 monks. And so the funeral pyre shall not be lit until Venerable Mahakasapa has, has paid homage to the Buddha the last time. Venerable Mahakasapa is now the greatest disciple of the Buddha after Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Mahamogalana have passed away and so the devas think that he should be present at the funeral and after Venerable Mahakasapa has arrived he circumambulates the funeral pyre three times with hands in Anjali and pays homage to the feet of the Buddha and then the, the 500 monks do the same and as soon as they finished to pay respects to the Buddha, the funeral pyre ignites by itself. The fire is intense, only the bone relics of the Buddha remain, otherwise not even ashes or dust from his body, so all the other parts get completely burned. Um, Afterwards, a rain shower from the sky extinguishes the rest of the funeral pyre and also the malas extinguish it with fragrant water. The malas collect the bone relics of the Buddha in an urn and take them to the assembly hall and they, they surround them with an encircling wall of spares and bows. So probably that was traditional way of honoring a Katya, a noble warrior who has passed away and then they honor the relics for one week in the assembly hall <coughs> Meanwhile the news of the final liban of the Buddha is spreading in India King Ajatasattu, the king of Magadha hears about the final liban of the Buddha and sends a messenger to Kusinara. The Buddha was a Katya and I'm a Katya. I'm worthy to receive a portion of the relics. I will build a great stupa for them. And also the Sakyans of Kapilavatu, the people of the Buddha's own clan, hear that he passed away and send a messenger. 
The Blessed One was the highest of our relatives. We are worthy to receive a portion of the relics. And also the Nichavis from Misardi and several other groups request a portion of the relics of the Buddha. For example, the Kolians from Ramagama, and, uh, the mother of the Buddha, Queen Maya, was a Kolian princess. So it's understandable that the people of the clan of the Buddha, of the Buddha's mother, they also want a portion of the relics. And so the messengers of the seven, seven different groups arrive in Kusinara requesting a portion of the relics. But the local clan, the mothers of Kusinara, they don't want to give them away. <laughs> so, so they say, um, the Buddha passed away on our territory. He will not give away any of the relics. At that time, a Brahmin, who is a disciple of the Buddha, is there. His name is Dona, and he's addressing the assembly. <coughs> Listen, sirs, to my proposal. For parents is the Buddha's teaching. It is not right that conflict should arise from sharing out the relics of the highest person. Let all be joyed in harmony and peace. In friendship, sharing out a portion of the relics. Let stupas be built in all directions, that all may see and gain confidence in the Buddha. So then the messengers agree and say, Well, Brahmin, then you should divide up the relics in the best and fairest way. And so the Brahmin agrees and divides the relics fairly in eight portions. After the relics have been distributed, the Brahmin says, Please give me the urn. I will build a great stupa for it. And so he receives the urn that the relics were kept. <coughs> Soon afterwards, a ninth group comes, the Moriyas from Pipalavana, and they also send a messenger and also ask to receive a portion of the relics. But they get told that the relics have been already distributed um, but if they like, they can take some of the ashes from the funeral pyre. <coughs> and then King Ajatasattu builds a great stupa for the relics of the Buddha in Rajagaha. The Sakyans build a stupa in Kapilavatu, the Lichavis in Vesali, the Kolians in Ramagama, and also the other groups. And the Brahmin donor builds a stupa for the urn at the Moriyas. One for the ashes. And so this is how the first eight Buddhist relic stupas were built around 400 BC, 2400 years ago. Some of these stupas you can actually visit yourself <coughs> because they were discovered by archaeologists. Um, about 120 years ago, they discovered the stupa of the Buddha's own relatives, the Sakyans of Kapilavatu. And the, the reliquary even had an inscription on it. This casket of relics of the Blessed One, the Buddha of the Sakyans, is a gift of the brothers Sukhirti together with their sisters, sons and wives. So some dedication of the donors on the casket. <laughs> and some of the relics um, are in, on display in the National Museum in New Delhi. And some have been shared with other Buddhist countries like Thailand, Burma and Sri Lanka. And later, 1958, the stupa of the Lichavis in Vesali was discovered. And yeah, doing excavations, they still found a reliquary with relics in it as well. The reliquary was dated by archaeologists as pre asokan so more than 2,300 years old. Yeah, so probably that's the original reliquary from the time 
when the relics were distributed um, after the cremation. It's now in the stupa in, in Patna in, um, in, in India. Yeah. Also the stupa at Ramagama was found. This is the only one of the eight original relic stupas which remained undisturbed since the time of the Buddha. And just last year they revealed like an unveiled a master plan to develop it into a major holy site. But the stupa will stay in its, in its original state. <coughs> Also Kusinara, the place of the Buddha's final Ibana, is inspiring to visit. It's one of the four main holy sites. And you can see if you find it uplifting to recollect the peace of the stilling of all formations. Um, it's this generally most people experience sadness in this place, but then yeah, if you have more perspective of what the final Ibana means, then it can actually be something very inspiring and uplifting to, to go there to, in Kusinara. The, stupas, the stupa of the Malas of Kusinara was found, which marks the place uh, where the final Liban of the Buddha occurred between the twin side trees. And yeah, next to it is the Parinibana temple with a large Buddha statue in the Parinibana posture. And maybe you remember, after the Buddha entered final Nibbana, then the people of Kusinara carried the body of the Buddha out of the city through the eastern gates and cremated east of the city at the Makota Bandana Shrine. Yeah, and so east of Kusinara, archaeologists found the cremation site of the Buddha, just like described in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Uh, stupa was built over the cremation site, which you can also see today. And um, under the stupa, yeah, they still found some ashes of the funeral pyre. Yeah, so it's also nice to recollect that these events described in this Sutta, Tikkunikai number 16, have really happened 2400 years ago. So this is the end of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and the end of the life of the Buddha. But as the Buddha says, we, should, we shouldn't think that his instruction has ended and that we have no more teacher. But we still have the Dhamma, the, his teachings and the monastic discipline to guide us. Yeah, and this way of practice that leads to awakening that the Buddha discovered is a timeless method. It still leads to the same results like 2,500 years ago, if you practice it correctly. So even if the Buddha is not alive anymore, we can still follow his instructions and apply them and realize awakening. Yeah, just like the Buddha said to his last personal disciple, a few hours before his final Libana. If the monks dwell widely, the world will not become empty of arahants. And so, yeah, as long as people practice correctly, then people can also realize the different stages of awakening. <coughs>